Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to welcome you all in the third session of this Smarties Summer School. It's actually the first uh, time, well, at least here in Belgium, that it's a Smarties Summer School because it's the first Wednesday we will have some, we, we have some sun with us. Um, before we start, I just want to uh, tell you that when you have questions during this session that that you can use the community chat on the left and then afterwards uh, Thomas will be happy to answer the questions for you. Because our presenter for today is uh, Thomas. Thomas is a research director here at Insights and he recently moved from the Belgian to the New York office but I'm sure he will tell you himself a little more about that. So I'm gonna pass on the word to him. Enjoy! Thank you, Natalie. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks indeed for joining um, this third edition of our Smarty Summer School. Uh, and I'm very happy to introduce you to the story of the Consumer um, Consulting Board. I'm Thomas and indeed um, recently made the move from lovely Belgium to, uh, let's say, amazing New York. So uh, always happy to show off uh, our skyline. Uh, so my background is in industrial design, really kind of focusing on, um, on the consumer insight, on the very front end of uncovering um, new needs, uncovering uh, frictions in the experiences of consumers and using that as a trigger for new campaigns, new products and new services. Um, and to, to name a few of the clients, I'm very excited to work for Spotify, Denon, Heineken, uh, MasterCard, all clients who are actually already applying um, the story or the method, the approach uh, that I will introduce to you in this session. So consumer consulting boards, how online communities have the power uh, to shape your business. Um, let's do a little flashback. Let's start with a little flashback. And if we think about, let's say, the past seven years, and although it is a, a long time, kind of seven years, um, that's huge. But we can say the changes in those seven years have been really crazy. And a lot of things have been changing both in, let's say, our own business world, but also in the world of consumers. Um, if we start by looking into the world of consumers and changes, then it's no surprise that conversations have been making or breaking brands. Through social media, ordinary consumers have the power to make and break a brand. And I'm sure I don't have to give you negative or positive examples. There'll be brands popping up in your mind already, some good old classics, some newer ones. Uh, but we have all experienced that social media has given tremendous power to consumers uh, because marketing doesn't have the full control over broadcasted messages anymore. So these empowered consumers are not only talking about brands, products and services. Luckily for us, they also want to talk with brands. So not only about, but also with brands. And uh, we do a yearly study where we kind of follow the the, the mindset and the willingness of consumers uh, to collaborate with the brands they like. Um, and the scores are kind of varying between 70 and 80% of consumers uh, who want to collaborate with the brands they like, as long as kind of they have the feeling that they have impact with um, with this type of collaboration, that their efforts are actually um, showing off. So far for the world of the consumer, if we dive into the business world, there's this amazing song uh, by Daft Punk, which greatly illustrates uh, how the changes that we've all been experiencing uh, are feeling for us. It's harder, it's better, it's faster, it's stronger. Harder because kind of some, some industries are still feeling they need to recover uh, from the financial crisis. Better because even within these conditions, expectations are harder and higher than ever. 
and faster because everything's kind of going faster, especially if you look at the competitive landscape where suddenly, if you think about Spotify, for example, where suddenly indeed a massive brand like Apple um, is also just starting to compete again uh, with them with a very uh, in the very same industry. So companies can suddenly become a competitor if we look at our own industry and market research, um, we see the Googles, the Facebook, uh, the Twitters, who are also kind of having um, the strength of uh, having this connection with the, with an immense group of consumers on this immense scale. Um, and lastly, stronger. Uh, we feel that we need to kind of stronger become stronger to survive um, every single day. So that's kind of a difficult situation where we see on the one hand some um, opportunities but also some challenges from the consumer side and a pretty uh, challenging business reality. So to kind of take advantage of the positives and conquer the negatives, we feel that the key to success is being open and agile. And these are kind of two key values which an increasing amount of brands, especially of our clients, are actually adopting. Um, becoming more open, embracing these empowered consumers, moving towards open innovation, uh, thinking about, okay, they're willing to collaborate with us. How can we kind of build this into our organization? How can we move from an inside out to an outside in thinking, but also in a way which still allows them to be agile and maybe even more agile than ever, being able to quickly react on uh, on changes and kind of not having the very slow processes in organizations. So learning how to uh, how to move and how to react quickly. So open and agile, some of you might be thinking, oh my God, that is so scary. Um, because we've been doing a lot of talking about the changes and the openness and co-creation, but in reality, it's kind of, we're lagging a bit behind and it can be a challenge to really act upon this and to bring this in to a company and into the daily reality. Because if we do this reality check today, a lot of companies are still not open, not agile enough. And let's do that reality check. First of all, we see still a lot of one-way communication. Uh, people who are just... Um, yeah, afraid when they put a message out there for a reaction. To give a very personal example, as Natalie mentioned, I recently relocated uh, to New York. So I have a lot of furniture, a lot of stuff to buy from my apartment. And I think two weeks ago, I ordered a light fixture, uh, which still didn't arrive. And they still didn't let me know kind of when it was arriving. And of course, it's New York. So you expect everything basically uh, the next day. So when I saw a message on their Instagram yesterday, again, promoting the same amazing light, I was like, OK, so putting on my consumer hat, they have time to put a message on Instagram, but they don't have time to reply to me and kind of let me know when this actual product will arrive. Uh, so I commented like, okay, great product, but already ordered 11 days after inquiring, still no updates. And they did send me an email, but instead of doing it also in the open on Instagram, Actually, I was about to delete my negative Instagram after receiving their communication. And when I went back to their page, they deleted my post, which was like, oh, okay, um, that's not very nice. You can kind of solve it in the open without deleting um, my message because I'm a, I am was about to become a brand ambassador. Uh, but I guess they're not completely ready for this two-way communication. If you think about how agile brands are, and this might be the biggest challenge, I think we're still confronted in the reality of projects, of one-shot actions in the research context, a research project, a specific marketing campaign. Um, so we're lacking something continuous. And the key kind of barrier to this continuous element, which allows for agility, is actually that we're organized very much in silos, working the different departments, working independently from each other. So organizations who still work and have this strong uh, silo thinking in different departments, there it will be a real challenge to, um, to become agile and to conquer this challenge. 
So we feel that we're missing out on the biggest opportunity ever uh, to outperform the competition because if we don't kind of uh, become more open, more agile, because that's not our reality today. And this big opportunity, the question is, who's going to help us in kind of embracing this opportunity? Is it going to be expensive consultants? Is it going to be advisors? Are they kind of going to rescue you? Um, well, at Insights Consulting, we believe that's not the case. And we believe that your consumers are actually uh, the most likely to help you and the best consultants you can think of. And something's going wrong with my slides uh, right there. So we feel that you need to hire your consumers as consultants. And that's a very kind of especially in a research context, a very different way of approaching them. Instead of kind of thinking about Q&A, about validation, it's really about tapping into them as experts of their own experience, as experts of their interaction with your brand. And I will give you three reasons for bringing consumers into your company today as a consultant instead of as a passive uh, consumer or research respondent. And the first one is that consumers have already been with your brand for years. Typically, they have been with your brands for longer than some of your brand managers. And kudos for this presentation to Tom de Ruyck, our head of research communities or consumer consulting boards. And the cookie on the screen is actually um, one of his favorites. He even has this very special way of eating it, which is not how it's visualized here. And being kind of a fan of this cookie for all these years, he probably survived kind of five generations of brand managers as typically on average uh, a marketing manager would switch from brand to brand every two or three years. So there's no one else who better knows what your brand stands for than consumers, than the fans of your brand. A second reason why consumers are the best consultants you can hire is that they show extraordinary engagement. They go the extra mile. So even if we set up a project where we collaborate with brand fans, like for Ben & Jerry's, for example, the ice cream brand, it's striking to see how critical they are. Um, it's not because they're a brand fan that they will like everything you say, everything they do. They're actually very protective of their brand. They want the brand to do well. And thus, they're very critical in terms of campaigns, in terms of new product launches. And they want to help. They want to help the brand to move forward. So that shows a lot of engagement. And last but not least, they're probably the only consumers who are always right. Um, because they're the one who buy your products and they make that you're basically in business. So keeping a finger on the pulse with consumers um, is really key and also looking beyond uh, the more traditional methods of doing that um, to really kind of bring change into the organization. So that's what we're doing by bringing them into a company and setting up how we like to call it, a consumer consulting board. So although you might think online communities, it's all about technology, um, that's very much not the case. A consumer consulting board, an online community is really about people. It's a group of people who are united by, let's say, um, a shared identification with a topic, with a brand. So they're all very much engaged in, um, in purchasing laundry products or they're more focused on beauty or they like to go out uh, and have a beer once in a while if you would think about Heineken. So they all have something in common and we bring these people, we unite them um, on a platform, allowing them to share their experiences for longer in time. So that's the key thing that's disruptive there is that it's not just this one interaction, one moment in time, but it's longer in time for several weeks, months, and even years where you kind of can bring in different groups of people and collaborate with, um, with the core group, which is always with you, your core consumer. So if we compare this to these more traditional techniques like focus groups, for example, um, we see that it's also a closed environment. It's safe. It's it's protected, um, but the true power lies in these differences. More people, instead of six to eight for one focus group, we collaborate with 50 to 150, allowing that you can also recruit 
for diversity, for a diverse group of people and people who are interesting to us and interested to you and want to help you. Um, more people, more ideas, more opinions. And over this long period of time, so not just this one moment, they can also kind of think and rethink. There's iterative learning. Um, so we build up knowledge over the course of these several weeks so we could basically um, discuss topics with them after two months or three weeks which we couldn't discuss after just uh, the first day or within uh, a one slot session. So what are we going to do with this group of people who are united on this platform? Well, we're going to collaborate with them, ask for feedback, ask for input, ask for inspiration, um, which is making us more open. But thinking about how we can also become more agile by bringing consumers into an organization, that's actually means that we need to tap into it. We need to make it a habit to tap into their richness, tap into their experience um, by doing it almost every single day for almost every business question across departments in an organization. And if we do that, if we make it a reflex to kind of tap into the flexibility of this group of consumers being embedded in an organization, we can not only make ourselves more open as an organization, but we also become more agile because we have this feedback, this input, this inspiration at our fingertips 24-7, allowing us to move fast and making better decisions because we also listen faster. Is this new? Well, yes and no. Uh, I already mentioned some of my uh, clients I'm working with. Um, so we actually have uh, an immense list of, uh, of brands, big and small, global brands and more local brands who are actually using this either to kind of streamline one of one category of their products or let's say the complete organization around uh, consumers. So for Heineken, for example, thinking about their open design explorations, um, which is already going in the fourth year now, um, we're a partner there by setting up consumer consulting boards of people who like to go out and then um, capture new insights that helps Heineken to develop a vision of the future. 2012, um, the club of the future. 2014, the most recent one, uh, a Heineken pop-up city lounge, um, which was presented in London, but has also been featured in Mexico City. Uh, so really exciting and also a proof point that uh, consumers can really kind of help you envision and shape the future if you collaborate with them, if you understand latent needs and frictions and then take them away to shape the future. So Heineken, big company, is this also kind of possible for um, for smaller companies? And uh, we see that it definitely is possible because it gives kind of this uh, this flexibility um, in this. Uh, it gives kind of this flexibility to unite some ad hoc research in a in a more agile and in a more structured way. And then they can also even um, make it bigger in time. And that's truly where the investment pays off because we're recruiting people, we're setting up a platform, but then by reactivating it, by tapping into it again, um, it truly becomes efficient for bigger companies, for smaller companies. A second question you might have, okay, apart from budget, what about um, the objective? Is it only for, let's say, the club of the future? Is it only for highly innovative brands? Where we also see um, that you can you can launch this or you can embed this uh, for a variety of, uh, of business challenges. Uh, for Danone, for example, um, we've set this up to collect insights with young moms in the UK. How are they feeding their babies? What are frustrations? What are problems? Um, from insights, we can move in towards co-creation and concept development, which we've done for Air France and KLM to improve the transfer experience of frequent flyers. But also, once you have... Um, 
a prototype, an actual product, a beta version, uh, throw it into the lives of people, allow them to really uh, experience it in a real life setting, uh, which is something we've been doing for a whole suite of mobile services for the Vodafone group uh, and for eBay, for example, continuously optimizing um, their complete uh, activities from product development to uh, communication, go to market, continuous optimization of their platform um, in a couple of countries. So it's definitely more than just innovation. Uh, it's going from crafting those insights, co-creating, co-developing new concepts, implementing them, testing prototypes, and continuous optimization of the whole customer experience. So. We've seen why there, especially today, this approach of collaboration, of openness um, is relevant, is also adding, uh, adding a more agile DNA to our companies. Um, I've kind of explained some of the basics, but now let's think about, okay, how, how do you do this? How do you start by making this change in a company by really putting consumers uh, central in the organizations to serve all departments and business objective? What does it take to make it happen? And first, who's on board? That's, of course, key. It's all about people, not about um, technology. And I've already mentioned this, that it's about people who are interesting and interested. If you were asking me about soccer, I would not be able to help you out because I really don't care about soccer. So I wouldn't have a lot of things to share with you. I wouldn't be um, motivated to share them, but also my knowledge or experience would be lacking. So really thinking about what is the group of people we can learn the most from. So if we want to, for example, take uh, a digital service uh, and we want to develop a digital service for a mainstream audience, what we would typically do is, of course, have this group of smartphone users which are mainstream, but also a group of smartphone users who are more leading edge, who can really kind of help us and say, okay, within Android, within iOS, this is how it's done. Uh, this is what I'm used to. This is the benchmark for my experience, not only, of course, in the digital space, but also if you think about uh, creating new uh, a new service experience, thinking about from what type of user can we get the most, the richest understanding and then having this variety in the people we recruit. Um, how many do we need between 50 and 150 within one discussion? So even if you would have kind of a bigger scale like multiple markets where people speak in their native language, uh, you can do 50 or 150 for each of those markets. The key is just here that we think about what's the minimum required versus what's the maximum that's possible to have in a discussion. And the minimum required people is 50 um, because our research and research shows that we need at least 30 qualitative answers on one kind of research activity to make a solid qualitative analysis. So 50 is about the right people to guarantee the 30 valid response because people kind of are empowered to also react on the topics of their choice. The maximum is actually defined by when is a conversation not really kind of a good qualitative conversation. If there's too many people, then people kind of just become these random names. While if you kind of keep it below the 150 mark, you're actually able both from a research perspective as a moderator, but also as a participant uh, to kind of remember, okay, who's who and what does this people what does this person think about this and kind of remember previous comments in the discussion. Uh, so 150, which is also called the Dunbar number. Where we find them is actually um, another key question. Uh, and there's a whole variety of sources, which is pretty much depending from project to project um, or from business challenge to business challenge. Uh, we can tap into more traditional research panels. Um, if we're looking for brand fans, we can tap into 
um, your social media followers, um, even when it's about a big product launch, uh, this type of collaboration has been successfully implemented as a key part of the collaboration plan. Like you can try this product out in beta for free um, as long as you also give us your experience along the way, adding up to actually if you're launching a new product, a new brand, really creating this group of ambassadors along the way through this trial period and learning also how to optimize your product along the way. Uh, so really a variety of ways to kind of reach them, a database of your customers, for example. Um, the sky is the limit and it's key to kind of think outside the box to find the best way to reach the best audience. It's not just about finding them, of course. It's also about keeping them. It's about keeping this group of people engaged. And that's not just, again, the technology versus people. It's not just because you connect them and you give them a login to a platform um, that you're engaging them, that you're empowering them. Uh, so creating engagement is key. We typically start just with a project within your organization. Uh, we would also start with participants in a kickoff session where we introduce them, a live session where we introduce the business challenge. Um, if we can announce already the client, we introduce the brand, we tell them kind of the roadmap of what we're going to do. Um, so really briefing them, giving them an understanding of what's about to happen. So making research less of a black box than um, that it was before. Uh, so this is really kind of to create this engagement from the very start and also to create a group feeling. Once we have participants kind of participating in the first activities, we have the next challenge. Because if we want to move to a structural way of collaborating with people, we have to make sure that we value them. We value our consumer consultants and we create engagement over time, keeping them engaged kind of for months or for years. Uh, and that's where kind of gamification techniques come in quite handy uh, to really keep this engagement going. And we use this kind of te gamification techniques on four levels, on the question level or activity level, on an individual level, on a group level and on a community level. So uh, on a question level, for example, uh, allowing them to win badges when they are the most, adding the most of value to a certain activity, to a, to a discussion. It's almost like getting a medal in the army. On an individual level, allowing them to reach different levels, leveling up throughout uh, their involvement in the community and also allowing them to unlock content, to have specific content which is available to them once you reach a specific level. This might be, for example, um, by having active participation in three weeks. In the fourth week, you receive kind of a goodie bag or you, you, they receive something, which then they can also share their experience and capture the whole unboxing uh, in little videos. So really also uh, the ethnographic way. So in terms of how it can be applied, it can be from discussions to private diaries to co-creation, really multimedia ethnography where they use their smartphone to capture an experience on the go. Uh, so that's really what's making it fun. Sending them at a random time in the day a message like, okay, what if you would do this now? Activation deprivation, like asking them to do something, to call a friend at that very moment in time and to kind of report on the experience if we're thinking about innovation in the telecommunication industry. Um, so making it fun, it's basically uh, as much fun as you make it yourself as kind of the architect of such an approach. The third level is a group level. So we can have different segments in the community or even different countries, and then they can also compete against each other in terms of activity, both in quality and in quantity. And last but not least, on the community level, announcing, uh, having announcements, having something unlocked after a certain milestone has been reached. So uh, a Follow video of the CEO of the company after 3,000 posts, for example, um, is typically another motivation gamification element that works very well. And we see again from our research on research that if we apply these type of techniques in the community setting, um, that we have up to seven times more on topic answers. So it's not about more clutter and just a random words. It's really about 
about more, it's about richer data. So it's not only about thinking harder, it's also about thinking differently. And I promise that this is the most controversial slide uh, in this deck. So really allowing them to think differently and use um, kind of refreshing qualitative techniques to get more emotional, more creative and more intuitive answers. And I already briefly mentioned activation and deprivation. Uh, but to give you an example for Shikita, um, when they did research and collaborated with uh, consumers for their range of smoothies, uh, they really wanted to develop a communication campaign that highlighted both the mental and uh, the physical benefits of drinking fruit. So half of our group of consumer consultants were people who were really living the healthy lifestyle, having tons of fruit every day, while the other half were actually people who were living rather unhealthy and not having a lot of fruit and seeing that as a burden, seeing that kind of as not something that was part of their routine. Uh, and one of the kind of most meaningful activities we launched was doing the switch activation deprivation deprivation for the people with a healthy lifestyle taking away their fruit asking them to not eat fruit for a week and report on it on a daily basis how are they feeling what are they kind of looking for as a, as a replacement and then doing the opposite with the people who are living the rather unhealthy lifestyle sending them a fruit basket asking them to have fruit on a daily basis and again asking them to report their point of view uh, of this experience on a daily basis in a private diary and then bringing them all together afterwards to have kind of a battle of arguments defending the healthy the unhealthy side and the impact of living these lifestyles so again this way of longitudinal connection allows us to also learn things and tap into their experience um, from a completely different perspective Making it easier to participate also helps in keeping the engagement going. So allowing them to participate anytime, anywhere uh, through a mobile responsive website, for example, uh, which is also adding up to a completely different set of data. If, if I go back to the example of Air France KLM about the transfer journey, by finding people, again, people who we can learn the most from. In this case, people who are having an international transfer experience actually during this uh, deep dive of collaboration so they could actually through this mobile responsive website report their experience on the go so in every phase of their journey uh, from the pre the during and the post they could capture this experience and share their feedback with us live in the heat of the moment so we don't have to rely on a recall on consumer memory so it adds to more personal, to more contextual information, and to more pictures, videos, these in the heat of the moment types of data. Um, participating anywhere, anytime, not only in terms of, let's say, device, but also in terms of platforms. Uh, so embedding it where they are or recruiting them where they are. If it's about the voice, um, uh, in this case, the voice of um, of Holland. We even embedded the whole board in a tab in their Facebook page uh, because that's where a lot of the users we were looking for were actually uh, spending their time during uh, when the show was actually live on TV where they were commenting. So for their social media campaign, we also kind of got inspiration and collaborated with a group of users through the very same channel. So. This is all until now about finding the right type of people, about coming up with a way, with a plan to really engage them longer in time. But a next challenge is how do we, what do we do with this massive amount of data? What do we do with this richness? How do we interpret this? Uh, of course, by having researchers there uh, but an approach we kind of also like to implement is having co-researchers on different levels uh, co-researchers being participants who are members of the community who also at their point of view in our analysis and interpretation can be from moderation to interpretation to reporting so here for Campbell's for example having certain threats in the community which are moderated by uh, 
participants and their moderation questions are from a very different angle than what we would typically fill, really also filling some of our blind spots. In terms of analysis, in terms of interpretation, um, crowd interpretation, if you think about all these observations from the transfer journey for Efron's KLM, we were not the only one looking at them, observing them. We actually developed kind of a game where other participants are also able uh, to look into each other's pictures and kind of the story that goes with the picture uh, to say what they think they're seeing and why this is uh, an important observation. Uh, in this case, we also did it for our MTV Crushed Eyes um, community. So the result of this crowd interpretation of having this additional angle of uh, consumer feedback on the observations actually leads up to between 20 and 40 percent of additional insights, additional insights from the same data. So that's really um, that's really what it's about. Uh, and last but not least, they can also help us in uh, in reporting. Like for Philips, for example, when we had a project about sleeping problems in China, kind of feeding back some of our initial uh, reporting or initial uh, summaries along the way to kind of see if we interpreted it right. Um, so that's also where participants in this openness, in this collaboration uh, can definitely take part if we really are embracing the openness and saying, okay, this is what we got out of it. Is this also really what it is, um, what it is about? So let's get started. How do we start when it would be the first type of, well, the first time when you set up this type of a way of collaborating with your consumers, how would you get started? Well, first of all, you pick, uh, you pick a pilot project. So you think about structural, but you kind of think about, okay, what's the first challenge that we like to conquer? Something that you might not know a lot about, but it's still high on the agenda. So we get a lot and the right of people involved and getting also uh, some awareness of this new way of collaborating inside the organization. Um, with a setup of such a project or such a new way of collaboration, also kind of measuring and celebrating success becomes crucial. So thinking about, okay, why do we do this? What do we want to reach? And what is the timeline where we want to reach it? Uh, and then, of course, celebrating these successes once you reach them. One of the most important things to kind of keep in mind in this way of collaboration um, is communication. Um, in order to be successful, it's really about communicating very well. And this has opportunities both inside the company, but also to the outside world. So let's take a look at both of these um, of these views thinking about internal communication which is absolutely crucial but also thinking about some of the external benefits and we strongly believe in this kind of three-way approach uh, to change and to immerse an organization in this consumer thinking uh, from engagement to inspiration to activation. So engaging is all about creating buy-in and involving people from the very start in uh, in this project, making them feel part of the whole process through a little game, for example, as uh, is featured on the screen here about their consumer thinking, uh, where we can figure out, okay, on a score from one to 10, how consumer centric are they to kind of create an eye opening experience for them to follow the project with increased attention in terms of inspiration thinking about this richness of consumers collaborating, sharing their stories, observations for longer in time, also translating these massive amounts of observations into something that's bite-sized, that's condensed, that's very impactful along the way. So um, developing inspiration or activation platforms in the next stage um, where we share some of these, uh, these consumer insights along the way with not just the core team, but with uh, bigger teams or with the organization as a whole. And one of our new and upcoming innovations, the Insight Activation Studio, is actually really about this, is about, okay, how can we have more impact with the insights we actually already have? And how can we make sure that um, 
they get the attention they deserve and that it's not just a static way of uh, seeing, okay, this is an insight, this is the, these are the proof points from consumer observations or stories, but also allowing people to interact and further enrich this and to add their own ideas and to own observations uh, within your organization. Uh, so that's definitely something um, we're very happy to launch. Can be also in terms of um, impactful ways like more on an ad hoc basis thinking about okay for this audience let's do something special for this event in the case of the heineken club coming up with an interactive infographic nightlifejourney.com which you can also uh, give a try on your desktop or on your tablet uh, to kind of slide through the night and discover the different insights in a night out so really by envisioning it in this journey way, kind of also bringing the consumer perspective to life. And in terms of activation, I already mentioned the Inside Activation Studio, but again, also more uh, on, a, on another level, coming up with postcards in this case. When the MTV executives went out to went to Sydney, London, Rio, New York, or Paris for a business trip, uh, we developed these little city guides for them to kind of not only look or visit the spaces where their target group of millennials uh, were hanging out, but to also kind of spend time and to immerse um, within their cultural lifestyle. And the impact of this engage, inspire, activate approach um, is really important because we see that it's not about just a research report, but we feel that the way this collaboration is taking place is actually impactful. Research is being used and people are actually having this reflex of collaborating, of checking with their consumer, of taking inspiration and using it into uh, their daily job because they're inspired, they're confronted by what makes consumers tick. In terms of external kind of benefits, uh, you can again have different levels of opportunities. You can communicate about the process, you can communicate about the outcome, and you can communicate about um, the actual learnings of such an approach. So in terms of um, impact, you, uh, we see that it actually can really change um, a company. If you embed this way of structural collaboration, this way of tapping into consumers as consultants, we see that the impact can be on three levels. It can be on your products and services, it can be an impact on your brand, it can be an impact on your company. In terms of the brand, we actually see that it develops a humanization, it evokes a humanization of the brand. If you communicate to the external world that you're actually collaborating with consumers, you share things about how you're doing it, make even the way of collaboration part of your communication plan, share some of the outcomes and also share that the product is co-created, uh, we see that the brand is being perceived as more human, more real, more consumer relevant, uh, more contemporary. In terms of product, Products and services, they of course, by having this close connection from start to end, uh, become more consumer relevant. And proof points there we find in concept tests, in ID screeners, in sales figures that companies who not only do this but also share that products are co-created are actually more successful in the market. Not only more unique or breakthrough, but especially more relevant to consumers because they feel okay. Other people like me have contributed to uh, the development of this product or service. So that's for product and services. It makes your brand more human. And in terms of the organization as a whole, um, it actually has the impact that you become more, not only more open, but also more agile. And thinking about 48-hour challenges, like you're unsure about something, you launch a new activity with your consumers, and then 48 hours later, you kind of have the outcome. You can activate them via text message, you kind of uh, make it a fun challenge, and then very quickly, um, they will be there to help you and to assist you. Uh, so that's really crucial there. 
how do we move from, let's say, a pilot project to a more structural way? That's actually by keeping the structural mindset already in our head from the start. So thinking about, okay, we're not recruiting for three weeks. We're looking for people who can stick with us for the long time. Uh, and then reactivating and mapping, let's say, the, uh, the agenda on the on the next few months and that's really crucial that it shouldn't the agenda should not only be defined by your own internal agenda but also by uh what consumers are spontaneously adding to the discussion so we always keep a lounge open so some of the activities are triggered by us because we need the answers to certain business challenges and others are actually uh, triggered by them so they can trigger new discussions themselves in a very special space on the community, um, allowing also us to follow what's, what really keeps them busy from a more bottom-up um, perspective. So it's an evolution, not a revolution in making it grow. And also what we see is what typically happens is that over time, more and more uh, organizations are actually starting maybe with one department and are then adding this or are kind of uh, sharing this with other departments in their uh in their organization to make it grow. Uh, and then as a final goal, which is kind of our BHAG, BHAG is kind of a big, hairy, audacious goal, kind of something that's um, aspirational. Uh, and our BHAG is then to have uh, a chief consumer officer in the board to literally have a consumer consulting board representative also in the board who can really have this impact not only on day-to-day -day decisions not only on short and mid-term but also on the long-term uh, strategy of the company so I hope that among you uh, some of you who are joining this uh, this Marty's summer school webinar uh, that there are some uh, future chief consumer officers in our virtual room. Uh, so we feel and we've seen in the past years um, that the perfect storm is there because kind of in terms of technology, we have technology in place uh, in terms of um, willingness for consumers to collaborate, the need from the business to have kind of this new way to open up to become more agile. Uh, so we hope um, this presentation gave you at least uh, some inspiration uh, to kind of get started with this, uh, this way of of changing from a consumer to a consumer consultant um, yourself. So now, indeed, as Natalie already mentioned, this is the this is the end, and we still have a few minutes left uh, to kind of tap into uh, a couple of questions. Um, if after this presentation or after this session you would have any more questions, feel free to reach out, connect on LinkedIn, uh, on Twitter, or via email, uh, so we can keep the discussion going. Because I'm also very interested in your uh, experiences with uh, with making this change. And we have a first question actually by Steve. Uh, are there any types of products or companies that have been more successful or less successful? Um, well, that's indeed um, a very relevant question. And we actually we see that typically uh, in an FMCG context, this is very this this feels very natural. Like uh, within FMCG or CPG, the fast-moving consumer goods or consumer packaged goods, this feels like um, a very natural way. A very also um, they have this kind of research or inside generation heritage. Um, so this is the next the next thing in their evolution towards uh, tapping into input from consumers. Uh, and there it's very fluent and you see that a lot of our customers looking at uh, Heineken, um, Dow Egberts, um, PepsiCo for example, um, are setting up these types of collaborations to become more open, more agile. Uh, on the contrast, you might think that if you move towards more uh, technology 
um, driven or service driven industries that they have less of an of a, of a heritage typically of um, setting up these type of, of or having this rigid kind of okay what is an insight what is an idea what is a concept um, it's not typically following this flow uh, but we see that actually increasingly for them just because they don't have um, the heritage uh, or the, the market research heritage in doing that that it can be even more impactful like um, capturing the whole consumer journey or customer journey from start to finish and getting kind of this insight in what keeps a consumer busy in every step along the way um, because they don't have or not all of them have the complete picture yet by having this more longitudinal approach it can be uh, specifically um, important um, even if you would look in an industry which might be uh, the most challenging, the healthcare industry from a research perspective, we actually see a big shift from a focus on only practitioners, only uh, health practitioners to a more patient-driven uh, environment uh, where also for patients this is uh, a great way to kind of share about their experience either in a private way or in, um, in a discussion with people who are kind of sharing uh, the same context. Um, so, so in that case, products or companies, uh, in terms of companies, the, the biggest challenge might be kind of the, 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 the culture of the company. Uh, so in kind of with, with companies who, who, from a culture perspective, have a less open and agile, let's say, DNA, you might need to think about taking it a bit slower and really kind of building a case of the, of the pilot um, and keeping the pilot within a core team before kind of uh, communicating about it and really showing, being able to show uh, the impact of the approach before you, you launch the initiative in the company. So I hope that answered um, your question, Steve. Uh, and then Stacia has uh, another question. Have you ever conducted a generic consumer consulting board rather than a branded one? Uh, for example, cat lovers in Berlin. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yes, I think um, a lot of our consumer consulting boards um, are actually in, at the very at the very start start unbranded, depending on the research objective. Of course, uh, they start unbranded, and then we would launch the brand um, after after a certain period in time to kind of tap into some some competitive perception specifically it's about uh, brand positioning for example uh, we do also a lot of brand positioning exercises together with consumers um, where having this variety of uh, of consumers who have clientship at different brands becomes really important so then we keep it either unbranded for the whole time but typically we will announce um, the the brands then after a couple of weeks to kind of have this more brand related discussion uh, uh, and some of them are even remain unbranded. Um, we do see that kind of this feedback loop is really important in making it a success in creating engagement. And typically it can be a great kind of motivational element for participants um, that they're directly collaborating with a brand they, uh, they like or admire. So whenever there's kind of no brand in a generic way, uh, in an unbranded way um, available, we just kind of uh, take our engagement tools uh, and take, take that a notch up, for example, by having videos of the moderator uh, sharing what they like. So we just kind of shift then the impact focus uh, from the company and let's say uh, the people at the company, at the brand team to our own team and kind of making the moderator more of the glue that creates um, the engagement solo in kind of contrast to having that together with the company. But it's definitely uh, definitely possible and a lot of our uh, our boards are actually unbranded talking about a certain topic in general um, like um, baby feeding or going out or um, a specific product category like insurances. Uh, cat lovers in Berlin uh, might be very specific <laughs> 
but I'll be uh, I'll be very curious to to understand uh, the the great stories and definitely also pictures they come up with. So I hope that was a question uh, an answer to your question, Stacia. <sighs> All right, thank you, uh, Thomas, for this inspiring story and uh, the answers to the questions of the participants. Uh, I think we can wrap up here. Uh, if you should have any more additional questions afterwards, you can always contact uh, Thomas and he'll be happy to uh, answer your questions afterwards as well. Um, so thanks for joining. Don't forget that we're hosting Smarty Summer School sessions every Wednesday um, until the end of summer. So you just have to uh, have a look on our Smarties website and you will see what more sessions we have to offer in the future. So thanks a lot for joining and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot, everyone. Happy summer. <laughs>